Game On, a sports podcast for everyone, a special episode on the soccer scene. This is Danny from Small World Soccer bringing it to you. And alongside me, I have not one, but two guest hosts in Carlos and Bryce. Uh, and we have our, uh, our star-studded lineup uh, uh, capped off by the one and only Jermaine Jones of the United States men's national team. Crazy to even be saying that. Jermaine, dude, welcome to Game On. Welcome to the show. So glad to have you on. Uh, a lot of cool things that we want to pick your brain about. Uh, but thank you so much for coming, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, I know, problem. like I said, there's there's a lot of stuff that we want to get into today. Um, but I do want to throw it over to Bryce first. Uh, Bryce, you, you've got a couple of questions as far as uh, uh, kind of Jermaine's time in MLS and, and the national team, right? For sure, for sure. So, Jermaine, have you heard of uh, BSI, the podcast, Benny Bellheiber's podcast? Um, to be honest, no. Yeah, but – well, so um, they've always been asking, like, who was your favorite player from, like – I'm just going to say from three different eras. So let's go ahead and let's go with the MLS first. Like, who was your favorite player from the MLS era within all three teams that you played for? All teams I played, or can I pick somebody in, I played the national team, but he plays I mean, in the MLS? Um, that's fine. That's to totally fine. Too. Okay, then totally my favorite uh, my favorite player, MLS player, uh, Kyle Beckerman. Kyle Beckerman and Chris Wondolowski. They're both. For sure. For sure. Like Beckerman's him. definitely one of those impact players, as well as Wondolowski leading an MLS score. Yeah. For sure. Love it. Yeah. And um, going into uh, – so going over to Germany, you put you started over there in what 1999, am I right? Yeah. So 2000, gotcha. I think around 2000, I had my first game. Nice, nice. Who um, and who did you debut for? Uh, Eintracht Frankfurt. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. Uh, a lot of you, a lot of MLS talent, low key, have come over from uh, from Germany. I mean, Donovan was over. I think he was over at Hamburg. Am I correct? No, he was at uh, the same time when I was in Leverkusen. He was in Leverkusen. But he would just stay in there for... Oh, really? oh he was? Yeah. yeah, we were the same... How was he, uh... We were in the same time. Yeah, he, he he was always like how he is. He's a... I always say he's an amazing player. He has a lot of quality. But in that time, um, he he felt he wanted to go back. He was young in that in that time, you know. And so he stayed the preseason. But he did a good job in preseason. And, um, but um, then, of course, uh, there was a... I think that time was... Dimitar Berbatov was there already, and um, they had already a couple. I think Ulf Kirsten was still playing. Like they had already a couple good, good strikers. I was a striker at the time too, so and he decided to go back, and then history. <laughs> and that's sure, crazy sure. too. You've literally played like every position on the pitch practically. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday, kind of preparing for this. We we're like, well, he's a defensive midfielder, but. He really was kind of an attacking midfielder too, and like you said, he played striker too. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, 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 and and what I what I think of is looking back at your time in Germany. I've always thought of the Bundesliga as as a league that's very versatile, where you see a lot of that happen. You look at your your Hoffenheims with five back formations, and those wing backs are, are almost just as much left and right wingers as they are defenders. Um, yeah. Would would you say that the Bundesliga was kind of a part of of molding you into that kind of versatility across the pitch? Um, I would not say that it really was the, the league. I would say it was a coach, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, because one coach, he gave me an advice. And in this advice, I always try to give back to younger players, especially now when I, when I see them playing and they ask me, oh, what do you think? For, how can I get professional? I always say, try to learn to play every position you can play. That's how easy it is because it gets tighter and tighter. It's closer you go up to professional league in the same as it from national team into Champions League clubs and all that stuff, it gets closer and closer. And most coaches, they have kind of like the 12, 13 players where they always rotate and sometimes they don't rotate. And so you always want to be ready, you know, somebody jumps out, hey, I can play that position too. Boom, you go in there, you know, this is what you said. I started as a striker, I was a number nine. Then I got back to midfield, it was a winger then kind of, then I went back to play a six, then I played center backs, then I almost played every every position in um and that's yeah it it I I think it's it's good to have that that you always can play every position and, and it's it's just a mindset I think. Sure, sure. Yeah, Danny, a, da, Danny dropped out. <laughs> did he really? He did. Danny, get back here. Yeah, you you, you have to have that out. have that mentality to be ready to step up. Um, 
So what, who was, uh, who would you say was a coach, Jermaine, that, that really installed that into you? Or was that something that as, as a player, it just grew on you? Or who would you say was the, the leader in that mentality to just be ready at any position you get put at? Um, he, he, he was kind of, he, he was my first coach in my professional career, uh, Felix Maga. And then he was my coach in Schalke again. And, um, and in Schalke kind of, we had this conversation. I was already a little bit older, but, um, but still when he came here, he always said, you know, when, when I'm a coach and you see there's only two or three positions open and you're on a bench and you, I ask you as a player, as a coach, you want to play and you go, oh, coach, this is not my position. I'm, I'm a striker and you're looking for a six or something. Then it's something wrong because first you love the game. And back in the days as a kid, you don't care where position you play. You just want to play. And now you're saying, oh, but I can just play on that position. No, you can learn the position if you want. And this is why you see people like uh, good number six went back left backs or left backs went forward or center back starting playing number six because it is you don't, you don't know when it's at, at the end, it's your job. And you don't know who will be your boss. If you like you in a position or he brings somebody in who's better on your position, but then you have the quality maybe to push somebody else out of his position because you can play that position better. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's real smart. And uh, recently you've gotten, I'm sorry, recently you've gotten your, your coaching licenses. Is that the style, like stylistically coaching, is that what you want to bring to to whatever team you coach in the future? Um, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I made my UEFA B, UEFA A license, and then I have my American uh, B license. And um, but for me, is that you know a lot of people that see me how I play, and they go, "Oh, you going in there? You you crushing like you know?" And I'm like, that's most of the time like complete the opposite because you learn and you get older and you get more experience, you know, from all this stuff. And um, I will I will try to give them, of course, that the first two like important things is like that um, find your um, the, the the right clubs, you know, and then find like you your passion to the clubs, you know, that's the first. And then and if you figure out that and know what you want for the future, then you have the passion, you know. And then it's just for me to guide you in in different ways because why I'm trying to explain that in this way was when I coach you, you 18, 19 here. I got so frustrated because I can see situation happening already earlier before they happen. And I was like, man, they don't understand me. What is wrong? You know, to my coach, my assistant coach, he's like, man, you have to give them time. You know, they have to learn, they have to get through it. And I think that's in, in teams, you have to give them, you see with Jurgen Klopp, with, with, because he's like somebody where I look up to, you know, Jurgen Klopp, or I don't know if you guys know uh, Nagelsmann, you know, in, um, from Germany and, that's people there, let the players be themselves, but give them a guiding. But the moment they step on the field, you as a coach have to go back and lay back and just watch it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one thing that, like, Jurgen Klisman was real good at letting you guys develop as, as a team and as players on the field itself. And that's really what – something that, that, that I want to touch on is how you feel. I mean, it's, it's been proven that you weren't very happy about the, the Klinsman – uh, firing or you know when they let him go yeah. um so it's something that like you have came up the german system and then mm -hmm. eventually you transferred over to usa so in in what is the biggest difference that usa soccer today for the young players what do you think is the biggest um i guess negative and how could usa soccer take it to that next level is, is my question to you um, I would say it's, it's, it's in, in general, if you see the own league with MLS is like 25 years or something now in, you know, in, 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 and then we were soccer. Like if you look from the years before, really, when we played uh, Panama four times, Jamaica three times and all this stuff, we, get, we got in now that we play Europe teams and all that stuff. We have more and more players going over to Europe to, to, to find and, and see really the, the top level, you know, and that, and I think all that is good. To, to see the, the whole countries exploring, you know, in the negatives is just still that soccer you have to pay in, in America, kids, you know, and there you just lose a lot of talent, you know, because it is what it is. There's kids, they cannot really afford this stuff. Say when we go back to Germany, back in the days, if I, if I had to pay this money, would kids have to play here? I would not be Jermaine Jones today because I would not have the chance to pay 
you know, to play soccer. And, and I think that's a big shot. And this is why, because you have the luck that football or other sports, they're pushing the soccer a little bit away because they're getting the talent because then they don't have to pay, you know, they're catching all the, the good talents and then they're seeing a the bigger picture and they're saying, oh, I can play in front of 60,000 instead of maybe 20,000. Or if you're in Seattle, you have 40,000 soccer, but not not every week in, in a normal league game, you know. And in all this, I think it's, um, there's, 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 there's good stuff and there's bad stuff, you know. And, and I just always try to push with soccer and say, find a, find a solution with MLS, find a solution with all the leagues you have and make a first league, second league, the third league, make college away, put college as the third league if you want to have education and evening for young kids. You know, there's ways to do it. But of course, some companies have to say, okay, I don't have any more the whole power because I have to split some percentage up, you know, but for the whole picture, it will be better for the country because right now you have a league here, you have a league there, everybody runs their own rules and all that stuff. But um, in, in, in now you're seeing, now the academy runs in for MLS and on all that stuff. And, and you just have to look behind it if it's really makes sense or is it just to protect people for themselves, you know? Yeah, the, the, the organizations themselves. Exactly. Yeah. So Jermaine, I got another question for you. It goes back to MLS. Danny um, and I, in our first episode of On the Pitch, we went through Best, best MLS soccer stadiums and support sections. What would you rank in your, what would you rank number one, would you think, in hardest and best support, se support sections? Um, yeah, from now, from the stadiums I played, of course, I would say number one is Atlanta. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Yeah, you have to give, not, you, not have, the you have to give a person ever. You have to give it to them because if you see how young, I give you all why I say that. You know, there, there's there's teams that have. If you look from where they started to now, amazing. You right, but then Orlando is is one that came in. They have what the complete picture with the purple. You know, Kansas City is a stadium where always is fun to play. You know, in um in, but I pick Atlanta because when you see what Atlanta came since they came in there you can see that an owner was really into the whole sport and he wanted to win. He wanted to give the training facility top. He wanted to get the, the, the whole picture around this whole team, you know, just we going in and we winning. And this we can see when is an owner hundred percent involved with the club or just like a little bit, you know, but Hey, Orlando is amazing. Kansas city is amazing. Atlanta is amazing. Seattle is top. You know, I love LAFC is now really good. So in, in I wish like, but then we, we, we cannot forget the smaller ones, you know, Colorado Rapids, New England Revolution out in Foxborough, or if you look into um, San Jose and all that stuff, you know, I think everyone, how, how it is, it is just fresh, you know, it's 25 years in. And if you yeah. see how it developed and everything, I think you have to take the hat down from all the supporters. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I guess I thought of New England Revolution uh, as you were kind of talking about uh, kind of the qualities of Atlanta, and I, I do have to agree, our owner's done a fantastic job from the beginning. Uh, Arthur Blank feels like he's really cared about growing this team and, and making it competitive instantly and not just making a quick buck off of it, um, but really making a, a successful franchise, which is, is unfortunately pretty rare in MLS. Um, but I, I thought of kind of all the attributes you were talking about, and it made me think of kind of the shift that we've seen in the last couple of years from the revolution. Um, and obviously I know you're, you're pretty well connected with the club or, or at least have been. Um, and, and I guess I'd ask you I, I, as a supporter of, of a different club, you know, kind of from the outside looking in, it feels like they've really started to take steps um, to kind of move that organization forward and, and to really kind of define themselves by a lot of those same attributes that you've mentioned. Um, and it seems like it's slowly but surely starting to manifest itself on the pitch. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like, because I mean, I, I'd say for a long time, Revolution haven't necessarily been at the upper echelon of that category, um, yeah. really being competitive, being in position to win titles. Um, do you feel like that's a, a culture change that you're seeing as well? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I think I posted something too last time in, um, about their training facility in um, mm. Because when I came there, I remember we were sitting like in a small guest 
the locker room behind the change, you know, in um, cross the street, like maybe like five, 10 steps cross from the patrons, you know, and they had like this amazing locker room. They had a chef in there and they had everything. And, and we were like stopping outside on the door and we were hungry for food, you know, but um, you should have called me. I would have got to go cook for you guys. Hey, that would be good. <laughs> right, you know and um but then to be honest it's like i look at it in you know but it, the craft family always were interested you know they always wanted to do stuff and they, they tried to in the time already when i was there there was talks about building a stadium in 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 boston and you know and they're trying to get into it and just that they have now the, the facility i don't know exactly where to build it but it looks like it's behind the stadium where um they had already the training fields and everything you know and um but it's a good job, but that's how it is. Like you have to see in general from the whole league, you have to see uh, forward going steps that what helps to develop and what helps to make this league better. Because I believe and people always laugh and I say it, but I believe that this country can be one of the number one countries in soccer, you know, because you have already different sports go with baseball, basketball, in, in football, you have three main sports where not really a lot of countries have that much sports in all three sports are accessible. So that means all the MLS owners, they're all own football teams. So they're known to run business. They're known to do it, you know, in, in this country here in America, we can see that we have the support on, on soccer. People love this game. But of course, we all love big events. That's what it is. This is why you saw when we played the World Cup, that all the, the 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 people in front of this on the streets and watching in big light like TVs and all that stuff bars full and everything you know because yes they all love the sport but we all love big events and if we miss out on it then there's football the next big event and then people go back to that and watching that and and you know and so but I think that the the if if we do step by step and we listen and, and don't feel like oh we trying to punish each other. In, in listening to steps, what has to be made and has to be done to go forward. If that happens, I think we are, we are in an amazing way. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think, I think a lot of people sleep on the potential <laughs> of the United States because obviously we're not there yet. We're not at the level that, that we could be. And, and you've pointed to baseball and football and, and all these other sports that, that we're really the, the prime country for a lot of those sports and in soccer it just it hasn't happened that way and you're right I, I don't think I've heard that argument very often that it's really kind of it's it's kind of American culture in a nutshell when you look at at our sports culture as far as you're right we're, we're always looking for the next big event like I, I don't care about baseball at all I don't understand it I know nothing about it I have no teams that I care about but even I'm going to turn the world series on because it's that big event so that's a great point. It's it's definitely a, an aspect of American culture that'll that'll be a, a tough mountain to climb, but I think an important one. Yeah. No, but you can see it. Like it's that's the truth, and that's why I'm saying like we have to talk the truth. To it seems like sometimes it can hurt because you think like oh we're doing something wrong. No, there's nothing wrong. It's just it works with different sports in America, right? That's how it is. And then you can see the whole base system that the owners said okay i'm stepping out we have to run it like the system we have already run it you know and this is why you see the normal season and you have the playoffs and but the structure of this kind of games doesn't work with soccer because people can just lay out like the whole season almost in smaller teams they have to work to playoffs mm -hmm. and then you sneak in with say like galaxy you just say, okay, the whole season, we play good and everything. Then you sneak in somehow, and then you're trying to run it through, and, and you win it, and everybody's like, how is that possible? They were not good in the whole season, but now they're winning the cup, you know? And, but in, to, to open up in soccer, I think you just have to run it. But we're on a good way. It's, everything is going good, and um, you can see, I always laugh because I always say, you can see on all the football owners that they stepped out in building soccer teams that – you know that they know they're, they're business guys. They know why they're doing it. They know because it's the number one sport. If I just I had a number somewhere and it was, um, I think the Super Bowl was one point something million or something people were probably, watching. Probably I, billion. It's probably yeah, billion. Probably. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a lot. Yeah, some. And then you had for the Super Bowl, you had like the three times or four times uh, more in the World Cup final, you know, watching people because that's the, the biggest event in the whole world. You know, mm. there's 
and, and, and I was so surprised because I was like, I live here and when the Super Bowl comes close, you feel like everything is shutting down, you know? People is just like, Super Bowl, let's go, you know? And then you see the numbers, I was like, wow, oh my God. Like, we're so far behind uh, soccer if you want to really put numbers up, you know? But Yeah, I, that's something with like American fans and they're probably going to hate me for saying this, but like I remember back when like the Germany games, like when, when pretty much in the group of death and there was this real big wave of fandom and people were becoming soccer fans and all this. It was great for, for us men, for, for the men's national team, but it was great for soccer in America, period. And I feel like it's kind of like it was going up and now it's kind of declined a little bit. And it's just because, and I think it has a lot to do with like the pay to play, what you said earlier, yeah. like soccer has to, you have to start them young if you want them to play soccer, you want to build soccer in this country, you have to start them young and teach them and, you know, sit them down and watch soccer. And it's not just football or baseball, but introduce them soccer. And a lot of American yeah. fans are newer soccer fans. Yeah. But I got, but I, you know, I always seen more and more because all my three young ones, they're playing. When I go out on, on fields and I sometimes sneak in a little bit late with a hat and just sit and watch, you know, be dead in, I tell you, it's, Full, you know, so many kids, it's ridiculous. You know, I'm looking around and I'm like, oh my God, like how many people are there, you know? And, and then the next point why I'm saying we will overrun fo American football soon, because I give you just an example why, because all the football players, their kids, they don't play football. They put them all into soccer because they know what they went through and it's not nice and not good, you know? Yeah. So all them, I have a bunch of them. And if you ask them, oh, that's your daughter. Yeah, she plays soccer. Yeah, she's not playing football. Or like my son. No, he's not playing football. Baseball is boring. And I'm not putting him in football because <laughs> yeah, I play football. He goes playing soccer. You know? Man. That's the point. That's the truth, you know? And the numbers don't lie. If you look behind the scenes, you see the numbers. Who's losing and who's winning and sweat right now? Dance studios losing right now in America. American football is losing. Because right now, American football is just pulling the people because that's free but if you call it in america soccer free done nobody's playing other sports anymore yeah, yeah i agree it's funny that you <laughs> go ahead Bryce. sorry about that during i saw your instagram post i saw your instagram post today it's funny that you brought your children up into it you have no idea how hard i was laughing with you playing with them on your beach uh, on your beach court yeah. that thing is sick bro Man, I tell you, I, I was I was building if this, you look at this I was building this thing alone. I tell you, I put the sand there with the with the bobcat and everything. Dang. And then and then my son tries to come at my home field, you know, and tell me he's quicker and he can he can beat me. I'm like <laughs> I told I told him, I say, let's do it, you know. But who hey, respect to him. He's like, he he's not bagging down. He's like, Okay, let's do it. And then he, he just said when he lost, I'm like, What do you think? He's like, I'm coming back. I'm young. I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's crazy he's got he's got he's it definitely got your soul and your energy that's for sure <laughs> yeah yeah have you seen the last video if you swipe all the way you see the last three and just take just slide tag and take his son out though you have to say it again that you broke up i said sorry <laughs> um the very he's last not, video he's on not that his wife you see that you actually <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You gotta upgrade your. It's all the way in Indiana, but you gotta upgrade that's, your Wi-Fi. That's like that's like internet quality Wi-Fi. Hey, you don't pay your bill this month or what? Don had just talked hey. about that with me today. Hey, you live too. in Malibu though. That's. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, now you're good. Better, all right, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Donnie had just talked about that. I was kind of a dead spot. No, but I was saying. If you if you look at the very last video, you actually see you like playfully tackling your son in the middle of that court just to stop him. Yeah, no, because he 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 made trash talk the whole time. He, he, he was like, <laughs> he's eleven years old and he tells me like, oh yeah, I can beat you one against one. And then I'm like, okay, let's do it. I'm beating. Him. Then he comes up, oh yeah, let's make a race. I'm like beating him in the race. And then I'm like, we done. He's like, no. And I'm like, so what do you want to do? And he's like, yeah, try to get the ball. I'm like, you serious right now? And he's like, yeah. I was like, okay, let's do it. And I tackled him, give him a, and he said, he was like, oh, that's a penalty. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh man, that's great. What that's, would you say, Jermaine? What would you say 
what do you want to tell the the young not not like the young like the kids training but like uh, a young let's say 17 18 year old kid that wants to play in the MLS or wants to play in this in the USA team what would you say is the most important thing for them to to practice to to be more knowledgeable what what would you say is the most important thing for them um i would i would tell them i would say just just be yourself you know um, enjoy the game enjoy the game every day because if you have the chance to step on this field, there's millions of kids that they wish to have this dream, you know, and, and they can achieve it. So enjoy it because the time will run against you the moment you step on this field, you know. Every time, every day, you play against it. It's not anymore. Nobody will give you something for free. And if you want to enjoy it as long as possible, work hard. Work hard mm -hmm. because there's nobody. The moment you get paid, it's a job. It's not any more fun, you know. And, 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 and people have to... In, 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 Definitely, I would tell young kids, don't listen to the outside. It doesn't matter if it's good or it's bad because it will take you. At one point, it will take you. Just focus on the game, stay close to your family, enjoy the game, and, 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 and suck in everything you can suck in. That's awesome. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Cool, guys. I love it. Awesome. So, Jermaine, I wanted to talk about the goal. Yeah. You might, you might know what I'm talking Price is about. At, so. at this goal. I mean, I don't blame it. Dude, this, this <laughs> is the craziest. No, like, no, seriously, like, I rank this probably top, top, easily top five USA goals. I think history. it's, if it's not it's number up, one, I, it's honestly, number two for sure because against a yeah, team like it's, Portugal, it's, USA, it's, I mean, it's, it's a huge man. goal. Huge it's goal. It's up there. It's, it's yeah. seriously right, it's right there with Donovan's goal against Algeria. So I want to break down this play. 64th minute World Cup against Portugal. Um, match two in group, was it E? I think it was group E. Yeah. Zussi takes the corner, and I am at the edge of my seat. I don't know what's going to go on. I see this deflection, and I didn't even see that you're down there. You're what, five feet behind 18? Mm -hmm. I want to say five. Yeah, something like that. How did you how did you prepare for that ball for that deflection? How did you prepare from seeing the ball to taking to the left to the right and then the shot? Like how did that go through your mind? You know, uh there's a story way before that because we had half time and half time it was inside and we talked in um in uh, I think Demarcus Beasley. I think Jurgen can well, native. Yeah, and Jurgen said something like, "Don't, don't always try to play the last ball. Try to shoot, guys. You guys have to shoot." Just, I think it was me, Bradley, and, um, and somebody else. He said, "You guys have to shoot more." And then, um, then we go out, and, and I remember that the ball comes, and I see it coming through. And I think Nani was in front of me. And I think it was Nani that the ball yeah. hit Nani, right? I think. Yeah, I think he tried to flick it or something, but yeah, then yeah. touch it really good. And then I get it, touch it, and, and he tried to come out. And I knew, okay, I have to make one good touch that it goes a little bit maybe farther than him so that he, the ball is running across him. And, and then from then, I, I just heard, I think it was DeMarcus Busy. He was like, shoo, shoo. <laughs> and, I was, and to be honest, I just tried to bend it because there was another guy in front of me. And I, I knew if I get it around him, the goalkeeper would not have a chance because he would see it too late. And yeah. exactly how, you, you know, when you, when you play with your friends on the field or something, you know when you hit it good. It's the best feeling on your foot, you know. You know something will happen, you know. And when I see it, I was like, okay. And then the same. That moment is just joy. It's, I was in an age where I knew that I maybe have one more World Cup, you know. And so I missed the World Cup with an injury 2010 in South Africa. And, um, yeah. and hey, you know, I, I still have him here, you know. This, this is the jersey. That's the you jersey. Know? And the jersey and my two, three dreads, you know. I put them in there. And... Um, it's 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 just it's history for that sport, you know, especially for this country. And um, as a kid growing up in Germany, uh, having a, a American dad, you know, and now scoring a goal for that country, and you know, millions of people who watch it at home, you know, the, and um, and you will be written in the books, you know, because you score you scored a World Cup goal, and this is why I have these two jerseys hanging in my room, because it means for me a lot to represent both of the countries I come from, you know, in um having this first jersey on against uh, when we played with, um, I think, against Austria or Poland. 
with the German national team as a friendly and then the World Cup jerseys for me, yeah. It's, it's, but again, I, I always say the same for me. I, I, this is when people ask me, why are you always worth fighting? Why are you always going out? Because the same what I tell the kids, I try to enjoy it. You know, before the World Cup, I said, I'm going out. I know that's maybe my last one. I want to suck in every minute. I would run up and down till I get my sleep and they have to carry me back to the hotel, you know? Because I knew just this is where everybody's watching. You have the biggest stage right now and you have to, you have the blessing to play there. So, and it's going to go. And that was by far one of the craziest calls by Ian Dark I think I've ever heard too. Touch I mean, to me. Oh. Huh? <laughs> trust me I, I trust me i watched it too i watched different scenes in kansas city and then in there in there it was it is still sometimes like um i it's tough to believe you know then it was just a bomb out that we're not going to the next one you know and but it's a different story you know yeah that was, that was a great call I think the, the story for, for that year for the World Cup was was incredible. To be in such a hard group, you know, Germany, Portugal, and Ghana. And Ghana is no no joke either. They were a very Ooh. strong team in the World Cup. They're good, yeah. And just Who had, did they have in on that team? Was it was it Michael Essien? Was, did they yeah. have him on that team? They did have him on that team that, that game, yeah. didn't they? Batman is I think they had Montari. They had, I think, the guy. What's the other guy? The striker. Who played for Sunderland and everything? Uh, Gian, oh. Gian or something? Yeah. As yeah, a, so as a more as a more Gian, as a more Gian. Uh, they yeah, gave us a lot of trouble. Yeah. I think I then the, then, the Brin, then Brins Boateng, he was on the team. Yeah, no, that's people, true. He, yeah, they he had a good team. Right. They had a good team because, but I'll be honest to, to you guys because I've been I've been with this with this national team for like ten years, right? In um, and I just saw the the trans, transformation, you know, when. And, and people always say, oh, he's a Jürgen boy. And I always say, no, I'm not a Jürgen boy. If you would know more about soccer, you know that Rob Bradley brought me in. That was my guy, you know? And then I say, but with Jürgen came that switch from going, being comfortable back to work, you know? And you were able, you can see it because he took all the free time that we have normally with the national team. He took everything away. You had every time you had to do stuff. You had to go to the gym. After the gym, you had to go to this doctor. You have to go to this. And then, because he wanted to prepare us with big games, with France, Brazil, Colombia, like teams we never saw. We always played Jamaica, Panama, with all respect to them, but we just played really tough games was the main game was Mexico always. Everybody said, oh, we play Mexico, you know? And then with him having this blessing that we can go, I knew that the seasons and the games we played, we were seeing that we got better and better and better and better. This is why when we went into New York, and I remember when we were, close to, to fly over and we went to New York and then Lexi Lala said, oh, yeah, no, I don't think that doing this thing. And I was like, what are you talking, man? You don't have any idea and you're just crashing us. First of all, you, you're in America, in America working for TV. Why are you not supporting us? You're crashing us. And then when we come out of the group and he's trying to be like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, now it's good. Now you're trying to back up. But I, as a player, and I think as every player in the team, you can ask, we had the feeling that we will definitely come out of this group. For sure. Yeah. And it was a shock. Sorry, Carlos, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, I, 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 no. was, I was agreeing. I mean, I, I, I saw, I mean, obviously you watch European soccer, you see Germany, you, you know how good Germany is. Uh, uh, Portugal, I mean, Ronaldo, Nani, you, you name it, and they're a star-studded team. So you, you, ex you know what to expect from those guys. And then Ghana and USA were like the two, I guess, two teams looking in or looking into the group. But I'm telling myself, like, USA could play a good defensive game. They're well coached. They're a tough team. I mean, literally anything could happen, and, and it literally happens. You know, you yeah, end up tying with Portugal. But, I mean, look, I love USA soccer, but a tie in the World Cup with Portugal, it's, it's almost like a win for USA. You get that important point. And you end up getting out of the group and, you know, eventually lost to Belgium. But even the Belgian game, I mean, you guys fought to the last, last second of the game. I remember the in game both, clearly. In, and remember, both games we actually can win. The Porto game first, we have the Michael Bradley when he's trying to shoot and the guy clears it on the line, gets it out. And then Michael makes a mistake and they cross it to Cristiano, goes outside, cross it in, had a, we get the, the tie, right? Yep. And then with, uh, with Belgium, Normally we win this game against Portugal. Then we play Belgium, 
No, you win against that when you remember Chris uh, Chris Wondolowski when he gets the ball. In MLS, he makes one. He makes him. You know, he makes him. Yeah. In there, he gets it. Boom, he hits it over. If he makes it, we 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 done. We good. You know. Yeah. And and that's for us as a country where people say, ah, oh, just uh, the girls are more important than the boys and everything. And now you coming out of a group like you said, Germany, uh, Ghana, us in um, in Portugal. And now you come out of this group, Ghana and Portugal going home. Now you bring Belgium with Hazard and all the guys. Yeah, yeah, that team was stacked. And we just like moving up and down, going and going and going, and then have the chance to kick them out. And just really, just with luck, we don't we don't make it because. But then at the end, you go home and you see the appreciated uh, appreciation from all the people because of what we did. We we hold the flag high. We were fighting. We were doing all the stuff as normally a small country in this cup, when the, in this country in soccer, you know, that we go over there and we battle them. But it comes back to this. What I said before, that is something with Jurgen, and this is why I got mad when Jurgen got fired because. Nobody gave him that respect that he was the one that we were able to face these people in this club countries in the World Cup so good because we faced them already before and we knew what we would get, you know, and everybody had to step up because we knew that it would be tough because it's not only names, it's good players, you know, yeah. and, and that made the difference. And then just when Jürgen got out, you saw that we got back to comfortable and I don't like, I was not able and I said, I don't like it, you know. Mm. Well, let, yeah. let's put it this way. I think if uh, if the uh, legend of Jermaine Jones had happened under Bruce Arena, it might have been a different story. <laughs> we, we we might not have had the uh, the next day training after that uh, that party that you went out to. Just so that's that's <laughs> something, Jermaine. That's something I I guess I'm gonna ask you about. Since you brought it to the dining, brought it up. I'll ask you. <laughs> I was okay. thinking of when Bryce yeah. when Bryce let us know that we like we got you for the for the interview. I looked up online and there supposedly is a legendary story of you taking the boys out for drinks. And then the day after you had a, like some sort of a, a practice, but it was like a physical. And yeah. from what I read, you bashed everyone in the physical. You outperformed yeah. everyone. So. With the Gen- January camp was that. And um, I remember that uh, this was, a, but that was on the Jürgen. And, um, uh, you know, in the same, like, exactly what I said before, you never know what he's planning, you know? And, <laughs> and, and I was one of the, the main players who normally is in Europe, but I had the, the red card. And so I was able to come over and make the general camp, right? And, and then I went to him and said, yeah, let me take the young guys, let me bring them out. And he said, okay, do it, you know? You know the schedule? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know the schedule. <laughs> and go, and then next day, you come back in, and then they say like, oh, yeah, you guys have to go down, you have testing. And I'm like, you guys serious? Like, I can't do a test. I'm, I'm just slept a couple hours. And then Jürgen came and then he, just like how he is, he walked by and we had a good relationship and he's like, you ready to go? And I'm like, hey, I'm ready to go. <laughs> what I can say, you know? He knew that I was out. So if I would give him now the chance to crush me. So I was like, no, I'm good. I'm going to get, I'm, I went on it. You know, you get the, the protection on the back so that you don't get to fell down on the, on the, on the, the how you say it? The treadmill? But the treadmill, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in um, so we had the protection. You get the mask, and you just run as long as you can, you know. And I close my eyes, and I know the treadmill is there. This holds me if I fell, and just close eyes and go. And then I just felt at one point like a tap or something on my shoulder, and they said like, "Hey, you can, you can stop. <laughs> <laughs> You're already way farther than everybody, so you get." You You're good. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, "Okay, down and let's go. Go sleep. Back go sleep." <laughs> Yeah, that was that's crazy, man. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great, dude. Love that's that. Awesome. Kenny, why don't you, I, you. I ask him about like the the youth soccer? I know you're 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 bringing to the youth soccer, so ask him something. Yeah, no. So I, my uh, kind of my my expertise. That's kind of a light word. I'm not exactly an expert, but uh, the blog that I run, Small World Soccer, is uh, about lower league soccer in the U.S. and um, kind of that that culture compared to MLS because uh, I feel like it doesn't get a lot of coverage uh, pretty much mm-hmm. anywhere below MLS and and especially below the USL levels it's just non-existent as far as telling those clubs stories um, and you know what I what really struck me uh, was you talking about um, if if the same prices to play club soccer in the US were applied in Germany there would be no Jermaine Jones 
Um, and that it's, it's incredible how often just about every single club that I talk to, every owner, every player, everybody involved in lower league soccer is there because somebody charged them too much or didn't give them a chance. They were too small. They didn't have the money. They came from the wrong background. It's an incredibly deep and really difficult problem to tackle in American soccer. And, and for me, it's one of the biggest hindrances to giving ourselves the quality that a nation of our population should have. Because there's players like you that you, you literally wouldn't have been able to come up through the German system if it was the same way in the U.S. And I think there are so many diamonds in the rough that have been blocked from those opportunities in that way. Um, it's just, it's, it's one of the most heartbreaking things about the sport that I love so much and the country that I love so much. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously I think, I think we already know that, um, uh, you're definitely a against the play to play model in the U S but, um, obviously from a, from a business person's perspective, from a youth soccer owner's perspective, there's a lot of money in that business. And unfortunately, a lot of those owners, a lot of those managers, uh, are running their clubs for the profit. So have you put any, any thought or consideration into, do you have an idea of how potentially, um, at the youth soccer level, we can start to overcome that barrier? Because I, I mean, I could point to so many individual clubs in lower league soccer that are making that happen and, and giving, um, like kind of college age kids that opportunity individually, but it's not enough. It has to be a system change. Yeah. Do you feel like there's any way that that, that can happen? That there's just that's easy. There's, there's, there's ways to do it, but it it starts in the top, right? That's how it is. The, the, and then the smaller and the lower divisions will get something out of it. Because let's say it's a, the different ways. There will be no Brazil soccer, or there will not be Argentinian soccer because we're South American. Because most South American teams, the top players, they come from favela or from from areas where they will have no chance to pay for, for mm -hmm. soccer, right? And um. The same is like when I kept, when I coached here in, in, in I don't say the, the team, but I coached in Dins and then um, one day um, a, a player came up and said, can I bring some friends, some Hispanic kids, right? And he said, uh, I have friends that work on the field in Bakersfield, the family, and they, they want to come and play. And I was like, oh, man, because I told the club, I let everybody come and I pick the person who maybe gets it for free and not, you know? And then you have all these kids coming, you know, because they're coming with friends and and you just see them and you and it's so bad because I look at them and they're actually better than the players who I have, but they're the ones who pay the flight for maybe one more and for like another kid and the parents, you know? So now he has to play, but well, he's actually not good enough to play because he, this other kid is better just from raw talent, right? And without teaching and everything, you can just see that he has more talent, but now this kid, I have to tell him, I say, look, that's an academy. You know, we play in the highest league in uh, 18, 19. So you have to give up. You have to give pay some thousand dollars somehow, you know, the flights and everything. And then how the kid want to do it? This, some adults cannot do that. You know? And now you tell him to play <laughs> soccer. Could. Yeah, you play soccer and you do that. And that's what I said. You will not have the Brazil team like it is or in Argentina, South America in general, if their kids have to play, you know. But the structure, has, again, it starts from the top. You have to figure it out make a structure, figure out what is the cost on the league, then have the academies. Say in Germany, you get a professional, Come, I come from where I come, say I play somewhere in a club, right? And then I get a professional. So now the, the professional team who bought me or got me something, give me money, they're paying back before you get a bonus that's to be professional. So they give a bonus back to the small team, you know, they give the kids some money. So just because they're running I was running through the system, you know? So they get money back and all that stuff. There's ways. And this is why I said one time, I said, the higher leagues, like MLS or in general, they have to figure it out, make first league, second league. So you can, you can lay it out, you know, and then look in which club teams, look in how many academies, you know? Because I'm, I'm too, I was traveling around, I played against, then you have Vancouver, Seattle, all the MLS academies, they're good. But then you have academies, they're not academies. You can see they're just, structure to make money because they can call a bigger number that's fact mm. you know and and that's is that good no you're hurting at the end the kids because the kids they're not able to play on that level because they have to pay for it you know and and that's i don't like and and then i said it once i said if you structure it good that you have everything running under your soccer 
and then you have MLS first division, US as second, and then you go down and down. Then you, you take college away, you say college is third league, you know, and, and build that into the youth system. Then you can actually see how much money you, you keep in board if you say, now is Galaxy starting or the academy starting now with MLS teams because they're seeing they're losing younger kids and younger age because they're going over and they're losing bullet shoot 75 million, this guy 25 million, and they're going out like this and they get no penny of it, you know? But you don't need DPs anymore. So what are you getting DPs? You know, you're paying an old player a lot of money. It's good, okay, marketing wise for the short term, but is it not better to invest that money in, in your neighborhood and see which clubs you club that you have to get more talent in and build friendships and uh, club relationships that around say Kansas City, around Kansas City are building my things. And if they have talent, the first step what it is, they come to my academy then at the end because I'm the best one, but still they're getting something out because they started in a club close to our home where we building our players and have our stadiums and everything. It's just, I say, you have to figure it out. You have to sit down, make it with US soccer, MLS, they're the main guys, the top leagues, bring them all together and then, and then talk, you know, talk. But as again, you have to be open to say, I do it for the big change and I let percentage go. And that's the point. It's a business at the end, you know, and mm. everybody started his own business. So this is because now you have the problem Nobody cares about the small business right now down there because everybody's fighting for their own business right now to stay on life, you know? Mm. And that's, that's a fantastic point. And, and I guess that kind of brings up the question that's probably a contentious one. And it's one that's been asked uh, kind of across the, the American soccer landscape. But uh, having said all that, and, and thinking especially about kind of your more recent words about how at the end of the day, it's a business for these people who are, who are in power and in control do you think that MLS is the league? Because you said it starts at the top, and I completely agree. It has to start at the very top. Do you think that MLS is going to be the league to start that? Or do you think that kind of a, a movement towards uh, no pay to play and, and towards a more open system for kids, do you think that has to circumvent MLS? Do you think it maybe comes through the USL system with their academy? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts there? Do you think MLS will, will want to or choose to play any part in that? Um, I don't know if they want, I, I hope, I hope mm. they want, you know, because at the end it, it would hurt all of us, you know, and especially young kids who come after us, you know, and, um, and, um, why you have all these other countries so strong and so good because they can pick all the talents from everywhere, you know, but of course, if it's, if, if, if you don't have it structured and nobody knows exactly what's going, you know, and then you have rules where you oh you cannot touch this talent because he's an R line you can you 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 one of this side you know so you cannot come over and take this talent like all this kind of rules what they have right now so that say Kansas City they have maybe an amazing scouting team now they're coming to Orlando they're not able to take the talent because the talent is close to Orlando so Orlando has the first pick and if they don't want to pick and all that stuff you know so all these rules you have to look in and I think U.S. soccer has to be the first one who say, okay, guys, everybody has to come on the table because at the end, we need the top players to represent this country. And when we do a good job representing the country, then we will find more talent at the end through MLS, through USL, because then all the kids come in because they're looking not any up more to Cristiano, they're looking up to the Christian Pulisic, to McKinney, to American talents. And that is, for me, I think that's the main goal. You have to look, I always say sounds bad but figure out to make as possible as much as possible players to send them overseas if they want to go if they want to stay in mls you know stay in mls but structure it good make it good that it looks good from outside and that people understand it because the worst thing is what you want is like big stars coming overseas and then they're stepping up too and they're saying oh the structure and everything is terrible how they fly the traveling all the rest the talents, like Slatan said it too. He said, sorry, but I, if I have two kids and they want to play soccer, I have to pay $2,000. No chance. You know? Yeah, and, when he, he, he could go back home and he could just, they could just play for free. Play for free. I, have, I, had, a, I had a conversation with Schalke and Rufia, and they told me, they told me, oh, come back to Germany. We, give you a, we, we find you a job in the youth system somewhere. You can work yourself up and your kids can play. Done. You know? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. seems to be right. Yeah. It, it's it almost makes too much sense for the U.S. soccer system to be honest, because I mean, really, you can you can just sit here and lay it out like Jermaine has just done, 
And yet nobody, I won't say nobody, that's probably a bit harsh and, and not necessarily fully accurate, but nobody in the positions of how to make it happen is really taking the initiative and, and caring enough to make it a priority. Just nobody is. And I mean, you look at how we, we've run through a lot of U.S. soccer presidents in the last few years, and they've all kind of come with this promise of we're going to change things, we're going to make U.S. soccer better, but it's all the same culture. Like nobody's really, really in there trying to break that. And why would they? They're making money off of it. They're, they're keeping power off of it. It's, it's frustrating. Um, business is a business. And the only one, yeah. you know, the only one who was the one who stepped in because he don't needed anything, it was Jürgen. And he, the moment they find a chance to cut him, they cut him out. He's because, gone. Because they knew that he's the one who lays out the paper and he, he shows the mistakes and he's, he's saying stuff what makes sense, you know? And, and trust me, I, I always, I'm the one I'm quiet, but I, I know way more, way more stuff, you know? And if I would come out, but I, I know how it is. It's, and that's why I said it once, it runs everything like a family business and you make your, you open your mouth against it, you will never be involved in the sport again. That's how easy it is, you know? And so everybody has to be careful because at the end, it's a business and it's run by a successful, strong, powerful man, you know, and, and, and they're doing it. And so you have to see and accept what they're doing. And that there's two options. You, you like it and you go with it. Or you say, I'm, I don't like it. And you step away and you just look at it from far behind, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, Jermaine, it's I got about one more. No, go ahead. Sorry, Carlos. Go ahead, buddy. No, no. I was just saying, like, it, it's like everyone has their own passion like I, I play baseball and like I it's hard for me to watch MLB and I'll compare like in the past two years baseball they're changing rules they're adding seconds to the batter and I'm like it's, it's not baseball they're doing it just because they want to get more views or they want to get more and I'm like you're changing the game of baseball because you want to have more money I think it's stupid so like a guy like Jurgen, which in my eyes, probably in other people's eyes, maybe yourself, Jermaine, but like I thought he was the best coach ever the USA ever had as far as like what he knew of soccer itself and like the way he was advancing our our the the knowledge of soccer for the country. And then he get he pretty much get kicked out the door and then it seems like we're we're going backwards instead of forwards in the past few years. So, you know that we we knew we knew already. Net, this is like the crazy part on this whole thing. I just say that, and then is we knew it already in Cup America to try to fire him, but we just played a good Cup America, so then they had no chance. And then we lost against Mexico. And the day before we traveled to Costa Rica, we had meetings with Jurgen and Jurgen told all half players American and said, "You all on the list, you will get all fired." And we like. That makes no sense. Like we players, and they're like, wait, step by step, they will pull you all out. You all, they don't want you in the, in the system anymore. And then you see how what it happened. All like, look, Fabian Johnson, me, that this slow by slow, they pushed us all out without a reason and without saying something. I always said to Bruce Arena when we had this conversation, he told me, I'm not playing you. I'm like, I'm coming from a top World Cup in everything. And then we go now to another World Cup. Why is who are you putting in front of me? If he's better, let me battle against him. And let's see, you know? But you're taking me out because you're saying McCartney or Mc, uh, what's the, the, he's now in Nashville. Oh, um, oh. That'd be, yeah, Dax McCarty. Uh, McCarty, yeah, Dax McCarty is better than you. And then I think he said, Nagby is better than you. Sorry, yeah, I, I always get the mixed up. I always get Columbus and Nashville mixed up. So that's why I said that. That's why I said yeah. Nagby. No, but it's by, but Nagby Indians, they were both in the same position. Yeah. So he said, they're both better than you. And I was like, okay, that's your, how you see it. Okay, then, then let me play. And he's like, no, I'm, I will not call you in anymore for the camps. And I was like, okay, so it actually. That makes I, no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You know, and then, and then it started like that. And then. And then, yeah, and then, and then I said, okay, you know what, this guy, and then I was just pissed, and I said, you know what, this, he can F me, you know, because, you know, because he's just not a man enough to say the truth, you know, because I knew, and I'm long in this business, too, and I know people behind the scenes, too, and I know people behind, and actually what they told me, 
exactly happened, you know. And there was no reason. And then you have the, the bad part is just that you have you have players and the players you run for 10 years with them and they all go, JJ, we know, we know, you have to be here. But if we say something, we out to, you know, and we just running on we want to get paid too, you know, and and that's how it is, you know, and this is at the end, then you see the result. You see the result. At the end, we just all kind of mixed players went out and the full American came back and they tried to push that because it was a better picture to send out players, especially who play in MLS. Now they get national players. Now they get more pricing. Now they play World Cup. Now I can sell them for way more than they normally uh, go for the table, you know. They're better than the players? No, because why they're playing overseas or they're playing here? There's always a reason, you know. And if it's just their decision, I don't know, you know, because I, I don't call the names, but you can send out are they top four or five top players? Five, four to five top players from MLS were national team players. He sent them for a preseason. He wanted to get them chances that they can play overseas. All five players got sent it back because they will not play overseas. But they all were kind of almost starters for the national team, you know? And that says something, you know? And then they go back to the MLS teams and they're back to superstars, they're the captains, and they can do whatever they want, you know? And that's stuff people don't know, you know? People, how you can know that? But then that's the stuff that comes out then and people be like, oh, why he get fired? Because he says, you can say something against the league and says, yeah, that's actually not that good to be national players, you know? And that's, and there's so many issues could, yeah, in the whole time, but, you know, life is... Sometimes you don't understand what is happening, you know, but that's what, that's, that's really the story with Bruce, you know. I had with Bruce so many questions, you know, for me it was just the weird part because he wanted to get me to Galaxy before, you know, and he wanted to start me, he wanted to play me, now he got me as a player, but now he says, I cannot play you anymore. But then another point, he has the same agent like the other guys, the other guys, you know. And then I knew, okay, where everything comes from. And I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm watching from behind, guys. Good luck. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. It's, that's insane. To see so many players like you who are obviously at the talent level to keep playing. And it's it's literally not about talent at some point. And we saw that. We, just oh. like you said, it, we, we saw what sacrificing talent did for us. And it is, it is, <laughs> it is, it is really, it's, it's and that's that's what I said in the beginning. I said I want that everything changed because of the fans, right? Mm. Because take the players, take everybody away. The fans just I want them to because the, they have the dream to have this league one time the best league in the world, right? And they're making everything to support this league. They're making everything to support their own teams, you know. But then they actually get kind of kind of food, you know, because they're not getting really laid out the real truth and everything. Why it's struggling, you know. And, um, but if you talk with owners of USL and you, and you see how pissed they are about stuff, what is happening and why they're not getting the second division league or the this and stuff, you know, there's teams that they, they don't say, oh, we want to be in the first league. They're saying we play second division and we fight ourselves up to come in the first, you know, but then the other says, no, we're not going to risk to go down because we invested way too much money. I'm not going down. No chance. You know, I want to get profit out of this and not lose it. So, if you go back 25 years, if don't, somebody would tell me that I have a franchise from 150 or 200 million dollars and I invest 5 million, man, I would try to get the 5 million. Well, I don't know where, but I would try to get it, you know? <laughs> the best investment you can do, you know? In, in you have like the risk, this is so slow because you have no up and down and all that stuff. And, and that is just the, that's just the, the, the problems, you know? That's the stuff they have, to, they have to fix. And if they don't fix it, you will always be the same level. It will always be all divided in different different leagues and different clubs and all that stuff. So Jermaine, I got one more question for you. I know yes. we I know we're over over our limit right now, but I've been dying to ask this question. So just today, St. Louis just announced that they are gonna be adding MLS team to their city. Are we in need of a relegation system? In yeah. your opinion? Yeah. You think so? Yeah, he's I, just I, that's what I said before, you know, that's, that, yeah. that's, you need pressure, you know, everybody lives under pressure, you know, if, if you shouldn't, if you cannot get, get, get really fired in the league, because you can get traded everywhere, and you have players that get everywhere playing six teams, in a, or I don't know, in a year, you know, 
if you don't have that, you have to give them pressure and say, if we go down, that's a pressure. That's a pressure for the owner because then now he has to invest money to make this team good. You know, so there's pressure. And the players have to get pressure because if you going down, I will maybe kick you out. And there's, in general, new pressure is always good to keep the balance on, on a good level, you know? And this is, players need that. I always say player need that because say like you, you don't play normally in Germany, say you play for a top league, not top team. Now you're not playing at the top team. Now you have the chance, the, the clock that you say play in Chelsea. Now you can go to a midfield team, right? Now you're playing a midfield team, maybe p don't play too. So you go in a, in a lower division team where it's just maybe came up from the second division or something. But if you're not playing there and you don't make it, people say he's not good enough for first league. Now you're going down in the second division, you know? That's the normal step how it has to be. You have to fight and prove, you know? And it cannot be that you just like, floating the whole time in one league, but never really showing up, you know, and being good. And that's miss, I miss on players, you know, because in all three teams I was, I miss that, you know, winning, losing, they don't, kind of, kind of, they don't care, you know, because there's not, there's nothing happens, you know. The most important games is end of the season, close to playoffs. So there's like where you have to concentrate. You have to concentrate for the supporter shield, you know, Turn, the tournament, there's just stuff, but, what is actually the, the most important would be playoffs work, normal season. Now, first three, go to the with uh, Conquer Cup Champions League. This, so you have it. This whole season you have to fight. Everybody goes the same through, you know? In that playoff, not all that stuff, you know? But there's like, there, there's so many stuff, you know? And there's so, so many problems. That I, I said, it's, the, the, another problem was what I said was, look the players who retire. Why is it st still that you have players retire like the Marcus Greasy, Gucci Nieve, myself, players who still have no say, no soccer jobs now, why they're not the first one to get pulled into the system because they can give back? It doesn't matter if it's in a youth system or a sporting director or a coach. Why, why you don't take them in just to give your knowledge? Mm -hmm. Because we have a younger brain and we have a different scene because we have maybe played overseas and stuff has to be changed for us because we want to see a change but maybe some people don't want that. So, so keep us out of the boat because then you keep the, the problem in the people who talk, you know, because then you, you can say, okay, don't get them on board, let them do whatever they want to do, you know, and, and we save from our side and we run a business how we want to run it. Yeah, it's unfortunate because then you lose that opportunity to grow from other countries. And obviously that's something we need. That's something any country is, is obviously looking to do is to, grow from watching other countries around them that's that's just the soccer principle that's I mean, a life this principle. this year i saw um the the premier league i think uh, i believe it was austin austin villa and like embassy sports made the game such a big deal and i'm sure they made money off of that like and they made such a big deal because they were one of the teams i was gonna get relegated you need that competition like you said it it keeps yeah. it keeps you on your toes and not only that it makes every game important it's not you know, like LA Galaxy in the first week could be like, oh, we're going to bench everyone because we don't have to play it till the end of the year. It makes yeah. every single game in the MLS more competitive if but you're fighting is, to stay in the league. Yeah, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's what it is. And if you have that not as a league or a thing, you have a problem. Look what Christian Pulisic said on my broadcast. He said he was the, in that main thing, he was the kind of the guy in the, now he's the main guy in this country. Number 10, everybody's raising him up. He goes to Chelsea and nobody heck knows him. He has to start over and fight again for his position. He sits on a bench where normally he will come back here. He will do whatever he wants to do. They will market him out. They will do branding with him and he will be, he will be the man Donovan, you know? But then overseas, this is why I like the kid because he's overseas and he says, you know what? I'll take that. As a young kid in Dortmund, went out in Chelsea where he goes still, people don't know him. And he's the number one guy in America. And people look at him and be like, huh. And he fights his ass off to make it up there that people be. And this is why I say, that is, I take pressure on, you know? I take pressure on and I go to risk. And this kid, this is why I like him because he, when people say, oh, he's like Donovan. No, he's not. He's a, he's a risk taker. Donovan never was a risk taker. He took just the marketing wise. He was smart because he had Rich Mudskin. And Rich Mudskin was somebody who built everything here in America with. So he was, in that way, the smarter guy, you know. But 
Chris Bullitt, McKenny, all the American young kids, Raina now, man, that's the ones where I see and I say, that's the ones I want because that's the one they want to mess and they want to play with the best people in the, in the, in the league, you know, in the best world, in the world, you know, and, and this is where kids get excited, like my kids, they want to play them, they want to be Cristiano Ronaldo, they want to be Messi, or they say, oh, I want to be like Christian Pulisic, you know, or they triple and they say stuff and like, you know, and then I say, yeah, that's exactly how it is, you know. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's well said. Well, boys, uh, it, it seems like we're hitting our uh, our time. It went by way too fast. I'm not okay with that. Oh, <laughs> it, it felt like four and a half minutes and not 45. Um, but uh, Jermaine, obviously, you're, you're a busy man. Uh, just because you're not playing on the pitch does not mean that uh, you're not still involved with soccer like we've already spoken of in a lot of ways. Uh, what else are, are you kind of uh, up to right now that people can follow? Um, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm in the management business, so now I'm I'm doing managing, you know, in a little bit. But then the funny part is like I I went into construction, so yeah, construction. <laughs> building, I saw that. And, I saw so, yeah. that you're you're working on your uh, working on the pool. Yeah, I'm working on my whole house, and um, yeah, I got I got caught on that, you know, going out there in in learning and doing stuff. It's it's fun, you know. I, I really like it. And um, the business side from the management side, it's it's kind of of ice right now anyways you know so but um that's the next thing i think it's uh i always i don't know managing coaching that's so you know it's really I, close you know i read somewhere that you you have a business starting that you're gonna start a, a a company like a workout company is that true uh no i was like just for myself i was doing a workout uh, challenge for myself but i oh. have i have the two business the construction side in uh, sport management Dang, awesome, yeah, man. that's it's cool. Doing a little bit of everything, I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just like you know, we're, we're, sometimes you know, people don't know. There's, there's two ways I can say, oh, I wait for the coaching job, you know, or I'm doing something next to it. And um, I I had to work on my house, so I was like, you know what, I'm trying to learn that and go into it because I did it when I was younger before I got professional, you know, and um, and then now have fun on that. And the management side is exactly what I said before. I just trying to help the, the youth, the, the, the kids after me, you know, to, to give them the outlays, exactly what I talked to you. I give them the right information of what is important, like what do you have, what agents you pick, you know? It's not like just picking me, just I trying to outlet them, like what is the good on this when you pick this? What is the good on this? What is the negative? And like lay it really out for them so they can understand it and the families can understand it, you know, without yeah. taking profit because I had to like to make good money so I don't have to play kids and, and, and try to fool them around. So I just trying to lay them out so they they know the best way and they can see and they have the hunger. What I said before, you know, have the hunger, enjoy it, and and try to see what you want to play for yourself. You know. Yeah. No, and that's refreshing to be honest to to hear that common sense and that's been a theme I think of all of our uh, our conversation today. Um, and and so all that being said. Uh, really, I think I speak for everyone here. We're greatly, uh, greatly appreciating the fact that you came on today. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on. And really just uh, more than saying we had Jermaine Jones on the show, it, it means a lot to be able to have meaningful conversation with somebody who cares enough to speak up for, for what's actually true and, and to talk about what our soccer culture is really like and how we can make it better. And the fact that it's attainable, we can make it better. Uh, it's not a narrative that's being spun uh, by U.S. soccer, and, and it's really not a narrative that a lot of casual soccer fans hear. Um, so from all of us, it really means a lot to have that, uh, that honesty from you and that care, um, and it's refreshing to, uh, to see somebody like you getting involved in the game and, and starting to change that culture yourself, um, starting to help other people grow up in that culture the way you did. Um, yeah. I, I hope we see a Jermaine Jones uh, come out of the U.S. because of what you're able to do, um, and 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 uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, all the things that you've got coming up, all the all the great things that come out of it. Um, but on behalf of Game On, Jermaine, thank you, thank you so much for being a part of it. Really a pleasure for us. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you. Maybe next uh, time again. Yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> next time well, we can you. talk with the 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 Donovan talk because I'm sure 
Bryce would, would, would love to ask you some questions on myself too. I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a big Donovan fan. Let's just leave it at that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, cut it off hey. before somebody says something bad about Landon Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Not me. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Okay. Uh, Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much.